I entitled this message, The Struggle is Real. Uh, for some of you, that may not be a joke you understand. So it's kind of a current phrase that when you're talking about what's usually known as a first world problem, like somebody's whining about something that you're thinking, do you realize how privileged you are? Like this. I want to sit outside in my hot tub and watch TV, but the landscapers are here and their leaf blowers are too loud. Doesn't your heart just break for that? Yeah? So that, when somebody sends you something like that, you say, the struggle is real. Or maybe it's even more serious. You don't know struggle till you've had a phone that only charges if you angle and bend the cable a certain way. <laughs> the struggle is real. So there's a great new sarcastic phrase for you. Somebody starts whining about something that they don't even realize how good they've got it. So I titled that because we're talking about a struggle that is real. We're talking about the spiritual battle that goes on. And by and large, it is invisible to us most of the time, but there is a war between God and Satan, and it is deadly, and it is serious. And there are people being victimized by that all the time. And uh, Gary Bashirs, who was a professor from Western, came down and did a, a seminar for us on spiritual warfare. And one of the things that he said just really stuck with me. He talked about Adam and Eve in the garden, and he talked about God's plan was to bring shalom. Now, what's the word shalom mean? Peace. We, we translate it peace, but it's actually a much bigger, deeper concept than that. The idea of shalom is that things are as they are supposed to be, that there's this rich goodness about it, and it's the kind of shalom that God wants to bring to every marriage, to every family, to every church. And, and the idea is that God is working in this spiritual battle to create little zones of shalom so that He wants individuals who are in a covenant relationship with Him. He wants couples who are in a covenant relationship with Him and each other. He wants families and life groups and churches to be this place where people are loved and cared for and where difficulties are worked through and where God is lifted up and glorified. And Satan is the opposite. He's the master of chaos. And he wants to lie and to steal and deceive and destroy and divide. And if you look at the world around us, sometimes it looks like he's winning, doesn't it? But God's desire for Adam and Eve, he said, be fruitful and multiply. In, in the same way, he said to the disciples, Go out and make disciples. Both of them were commands for us to be involved in God's work to bring truth in love, if you were here with us last weekend. And God wants to use you and me to be part of that, that kingdom work, that pulling to His agenda, being on mission with Him. And Satan is going to do everything he can to destroy it. And in the book of Jude, he's talking particularly about false teachers who've come in and they have snuck into this assembly and they are bringing chaos and discord and they're bringing lies. So to get kind of an overview, I'm going to pick out one of the key verses in the book of Jude. It's only one chapter long. And I'm going to look first of all at verses 14 and 15. So Jude is quoting and he says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts that they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And you know, I think when we look at the world around us, too often we are tempted to believe that evil people are doing whatever they want and by and large they're getting away with it. And there's an important picture that that Jude brings into this scenario of this spiritual battle. And he says, he is going to come to judge. And he is going to convict all of them of their ungodly acts and their ungodly words. And there is a reality that sometimes gets missed as we study the scriptures. We talk about Jesus being a shepherd. We talk about him being a father to us. We talk about how he is the one that cares for us and how he is the living water and the bread of life. 
And sometimes we miss a very important word picture that God gives us is He is also the righteous judge. And right now, there's a big controversy going on over our Supreme Court. Because in America, the picture of a judge is an important one. You realize how many people's lives are determined by what a judge says. That there's the gavel falls after a decision is made and some children are taken away from their parents or some children are put back with their parents or a divorce is decreed or in the case of the Supreme Court, they, they make things into law. And so he says... When you're thinking about this path of truth and love, when you realize that false teachers have snuck in, remember this, God is going to bring everything right at one point. He is going to be the judge. And for some of us, I always say, how you feel about a judge depends on which side of the bench you're on, right? And the fact that God is a judge is a little scary to us because in the first place, it means that we are guilty, that we can't stand before a righteous judge. But because of the work that Jesus has done in taking our sin for us, now we are looking, and, and I don't know about you, but sometimes when I see this messed up world, I just think, oh, if God would just make this right. That there's a longing in us for things to be right. And when people do wrong, to get appropriate punishments. And, and for people who lie, not to get away with it. And so there is a part of us that says, yes, God, you are the judge. And there may be a part of us that says, oh, I don't like that accountability. And last week, as we talked about 2 John, we talked about those false teachers. And particularly, he's talking about not not ones that are clearly false, but ones that have snuck into the assembly and they are in fellowship with them and they are looking for opportunities to chew up the sheep. And there's really two categories when we're looking at the book of Jude. There are the arrogant, deceived teachers, and he says, have nothing to do with them. And then there are those people that they have deceived or are deceiving. And he says, you are part of God's team to help rescue them. So let's read a couple verses here in, in Judges, because I think you're, or Jude, excuse me. And I think you're going to get the idea. The first point that I notice is it says, don't mess with God. Or as another scripture says, God will not be mocked. So, beginning with the verse first. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Now, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. He doesn't say that. He says very humbly, I am the servant of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how much faith it would take for you to say you're your brother's servant? He says, no, I'm not, I'm not claiming that I'm his brother. I'm, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, and I'm the brother of James, who also was the head of the church in Jerusalem and who also wrote the book of James. And then he says, may mercy and peace and love be yours in abundance. And then he goes on and says, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation that we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Now, let me tell you what we're going to read here because I think maybe it helps you to get it. He, He goes through this process and he says, don't mess with God because God is the righteous judge and let me give you several examples. Now, he's clearly writing to people that are very, very familiar with all of the stories of the Old Testament. And that may or may not be you, but he goes quickly through and he says, let's remember in the story of God how many times People thought they were getting away with it, but then God brought judgment. So let me give you these cliff notes here. He says, remember that he later destroyed, after he brought the people out of Egypt, he later destroyed those who did not believe. Verse 5 or 6. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwellings, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. 
In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies. They reject authority. They heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn excuse me, condemn him for slander, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand and the very things they do understand by instinct as irrational animals, it will destroy them. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain, they have rushed for profit into Balaam's heir, they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. So let me, let me pause right there. He's saying false teachers are coming in they are wanting to divide you and destroy you and steal your faith. And he says that you've got to stand up. And don't worry, you're not going to be standing alone because God is that righteous judge. And even if it looks like you're on the losing side, you will ultimately be on the winning side. And he goes back and he does these cliff notes. And we don't have time to go through all these stories, but I have listed them for you. And I would guarantee that some of you do not know some of those stories. But he walks through this eight or seven stories about people who stood up and rebelled against God and they were judged. And I thought, how are we going to cover that? And I thought, whoa, what a great plan. Every day in your devotions this week, we're going to cover one of those stories. And as you go back and you read those through and you see all the way, in fact, it starts before the Garden of Eden with the angel, or excuse me, it starts in Genesis with the angels. And it goes through Cain, and it goes through Korah, and some of these stories, as he walks through, he doesn't even do it in a chronological way, but in your devotions, we're going to go through it chronologically. And I invite you to read those and to to focus on God being that perfect, righteous judge, that even though he's patient and gracious, and sometimes he lets things go for a long time, there will come a day when he will say, and that's enough. Now, there's another little subtext here that I want to mention to you because it has caused some questions, and in fact, it's causing some people to doubt the Scriptures in our current day. The the quote he makes here when he says, didn't Enoch, the seventh from Adam, the verse we started to begin with in verse 14, prophesy about them? He said, see, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone. And I don't know if you know, are familiar enough with the story of Enoch, but Enoch is mentioned in the book of Genesis. And it says that he walked with God and he talked with God and he was not, for God took him. He's one of the few people in Scripture that we know didn't die. God just took him home to be with him. And he was this very simple figure mentioned in, in the book of Genesis. He's actually the great-grandfather of Noah. But there was a book that surfaced, Uh, First of all, in Ethiopia, and then when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in Israel, they found remnants of this book called the Book of Enoch. And since then, they have translated all of it, and it's purportedly written by Enoch. Well, I'm going to give you a $1.50 word here. This is one of the books we call the Pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha means false title. In other words, there are lots of books that were written and people wanted to get, you know, extra credibility, so they put the name of somebody historical or important. And I don't know if you remember the Da Vinci Code, but it was all about the book of St. Thomas, which was written three or 400 years after Thomas died. Well, the book of Enoch was written several thousand years after Enoch didn't die. So the book of Enoch is not by Enoch. That's why we call it the pseudepigrapha. It is a false titled book. But it goes through this whole scenario. And I actually have a write-up on it because we don't have time to go through it. And if you're interested, uh, here at the Sutherland campus, there's some out at the information booth. Or if you want to get a copy of this, just write that on your Connect card and we'll email you a copy. Because somebody's gone through all 60 chapters of the book of Enoch and they said, does this match with Scripture? Does this match with Scripture? And, and one of the things that's fascinating about it is it talks about these evil angels and the Nephilim, and it, it fills in a lot of the blanks that are in the Old Testament. So people are going, oh, cool, I've always wanted to know this. 
and it gives you some of the names of the angels who are fallen and become chief demons. And it's all this cool new information, which is not biblical. And it's not true, because somebody's making it up. But it is interesting that in our current day, there are a lot of people going back to the book of Enoch and beginning to at least question the Scriptures, if not doubt them. So the same heresy that worked in the first century is working again. And somehow there's a lot of discussion about that right now. But what Jude says is the one quote from Enoch, which is also in the book of Enoch. Now, when a New Testament writer quotes somebody, it doesn't mean he's saying that whole book that I'm quoting is inspired. In fact, Paul quotes a a couple of pagan poets when he is talking to the the Areopagus, to the Acts 17 group. He's witnessing to some unbelievers. And so he mentions this phrase that's in the book of Enoch. So then some people are saying, see, the whole book of Enoch is true. And in reality, he's mentioning a prophecy that Enoch gave that was probably handed down orally for literally thousands of years. So in the very book we're talking about, there is something that modern false teachers are using to draw people away because it's like your church won't teach you about this. Let me tell you what happened with the Nephilim and where they came from and what happened to them and what they were. And, and it sounds, wow, that's new knowledge. That's cool new stuff. And so it causes people to move away, and that's the very thing that he's warning about. So he goes through this scenario, and he says, God has judged in the past, and he will judge in the future, which is the whole point of the book of Enoch. He says, God is going to come with his holy angels, and he is going to set things right. Now, what does that mean for you and me? You see, I think that this sometimes brings up a tough question. Because the Scripture clearly teaches two things. You and I are going to stand before God and give an account for our life. And I don't know about you, but that just makes me a little bit concerned. The other thing the Scripture clearly says is that if we have come to place our faith in Jesus Christ, then we have been completely forgiven. And this is mind-blowing, but when you trust Christ, your sins in the past, your sins in the present, and your sins in the future are all placed under the blood of Jesus. Romans 8 says, there's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So how do those two work together? How can I be completely forgiven and still accountable? Well, let let me be clear. There's a clear balance between forgiveness, which says, You should never be afraid of God because you are totally forgiven and you are now adopted into His family and you are in Christ. So the perfect love casts out fear. That I am completely forgiven. But the other side of that says that how I use my life, how I use my influence, how I use my words and my time and my money is going to have an impact both in this life and in the life to come. The the perfect example is the thief on the cross. He said, today remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, you have forgiveness. Had he lived any of his life to follow Christ? He would have had nothing to show. In fact, the the scripture is clear that, that we have rewards when we get to heaven for the things that we have entrusted to him here. And it's supposed to be not a, okay, I'm gonna get rich in heaven. It's supposed to be a picture that says, I am motivated by that accountability. When I was a sophomore in high school, I I took a class with a, he was a basketball coach named Johnny Johnson. And he was a big square-shouldered guy and he sat up in the front of the class and he said, the way we're going to run this class is every week we will have a new concept. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Monday through Friday, Thursday, you will have homework. Friday we'll have a test. And at the end of the class, all of your test scores will result in your grade. And I thought, sweet, I learn quickly, I memorize easily, tests are no problem, this would be a good class. Then he added one little caveat. He said, you will do all your homework every night for the whole quarter, because even if you get an A on all your tests, if you don't even turn, if you turn in just one missed assignment, or you don't turn in one missed assignment, I will flunk you. And he looked like he would enjoy it. 
you know, this big basketball coach. And so, you know, I would do my homework Monday night, and then Tuesday night I did a part of it, and Wednesday night I did a part of it. And I had the concept, and on Friday I would do the fine on the test. And what happened is through the quarter I was amassing a number of half-done assignments. And he did his due diligence. He would give us a note every now and then, say, these are the assignments you're missing. And by the way, if you don't get them all in, I will flunk you. And I think he particularly told me that. I'm not sure he, he was leaning on me any heavier than anybody else, but I knew he was serious. And you know what I did the night before the final on that first quarter? I stayed up all night and <laughs> did all the assignments that I had missed all semester long because I wasn't going to lose my grade to not getting homework done. And you know what I did the next quarter? I did my homework every night. You see, he, he taught me a little bit of math, but more importantly, he taught me about accountability and discipline. And I think that we need to have the concept that God is serious. That we are not given our life just to blow it any way we want. That, that we've been given life in Christ and we have been given incredible privilege as American believers. And, and for many of us, we've been entrusted with all kinds of talents and treasures. And the scripture is clear that there will come a day when we're going to give an account for that. And it shouldn't produce fear in us, it should produce motivation. Because that's what God wants it to do. He wants us to get our homework done. He doesn't want to flunk us, He wants us to get our homework done. So the emphasis is on that idea that God is a righteous judge, we can love Him as a Father, but we also need to be serious with the responsibilities he's given to us. And both of those are true, so there's a tension and a balance between them. The other part of this book, which he leans in on for the last part, is he says, don't mess with God, and then he also says, don't give up on people. He talks about those who've been deceived, and, and so he says, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, you, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by the corrupted flesh. So he gives them three bullet point statements, which I think are so appropriate for you and me. He says, I want you to build yourself up in the faith. He gives you this command and he says, you have a responsibility to keep your spiritual life strong. Sometimes I think we think that God is supposed to do that for us and we're just supposed to float along or we think the church is supposed to do that for us. Well, you know, the church is supposed to motivate me. The church is supposed to teach me. The church is supposed to... And Jude clearly says, you have to take a personal responsibility. And we walk through this chart fairly often where it says... There are four stages of a spiritual path, a discipleship pathway, and it starts with a seeker, somebody who doesn't know about Christ, and they're coming, and they're kicking the tires, and they're listening, and and they come to understand about Jesus' life, and His being God in the flesh, and His death, and His resurrection, and, and then they're set free, and there's that point of salvation where they become a student. And a student means there's a lot to learn, and a lot of things I don't understand, and a lot of of habits I've got to change in my life and a lot of friendships that I probably have to retool. And there's this whole process of learning how to grow and move. And then you don't move on, but you add to that. You're lifelong students, but then at a point of development, you begin to say, this isn't about me. This is about me reaching and helping some other people. God's given me gifts, and I'm accountable for what I've been given. And so when I've been taught, I need to pass that on. When I've been gifted, I need to gift to others. I I need to be working as a servant of God and as a servant of the people around me. And then you move, and often this is a crisis, you move to the point of what we call being a steward, 
or you say, you know, nothing else matters except making an eternal difference. And you notice it's a parent and a child because the key mark of a student or a steward is you begin to say, I need to take somebody by the hand and help them walk through this journey. And he says here specifically, I want you to rescue those from the flames. But the first thing you've got to do before you can rescue anybody is grow yourself. Or as they say when you're on the airplane, when the oxygen masks fall, what do they say? Put your own mask on first so you can breathe, so you can have the strength to help somebody else. So that's kind of what he's saying here. He says, give this spiritual life your full effort. And in many ways, Paul makes it like a working out kind of thing. We, we don't always feel like going to the gym. We don't feel like eating the right things. We don't want to work out. But ultimately, we know that that will help us move forward physically. And so he says, I want you to build yourselves up. And there are many disciplines in the spiritual journey where you begin reading the Bible for yourself, where you, where you spend time in prayer. Uh, last week, I asked you to, to read five statements and to read that every day just to review and reset your mind. Now, I'm going to make it easy on you. I told you I was going to ask. How many of you made it at least four days this week going through that and reading that statement, those statements? Okay, good. The rest of you have another week. <laughs> but do you see how hard it is to discipline ourselves to do something consistently? There is, there's something difficult about that. Another, another picture I think that's very appropriate is this idea of building ourselves up in knowledge and understanding. To become a student of the Bible takes a long time. We just walked through a whole bunch of Old Testament stories, and some of you didn't know half of them. And there's a process of learning, and our life groups are about that, and our, our, our challenge to you is to do some personal learning, that that becomes not something that somebody else is supposed to feed you, but that you are supposed to pursue it. And I think it's appropriate, you know, kindergartners love to go to school. Do seniors in high school usually love to go to school? Unfortunately, education is supposed to build in us a love of learning, and sometimes it does exactly the opposite. But he says, build yourselves up in the holy faith. And then, then he mentions a phrase that is perfect from what we talked about last week. Keep yourself in the love of God. I think that's a very ironic phrase. God loves us already. What are we supposed to do? Keep ourselves in his love. And last week we talked about the, the path of truth and love. And like any long-term relationship, it's easy for our relationship with God to become distant and lukewarm. And we talked about the, when you're driving and you're kind of not paying attention, pretty quick it's brrrr and you hit the rumble strips. And a couple of people told me last week, and Paul, thank you for that message, that was a good rumble strip message for me. When I ask you, how is your love for God? Do you, do you feel like you're passionate and that's important and it, it's something you think about and it drives you? Or... Is it something you hardly ever think about unless it's time for church or if somebody asks you if you're a Christian? And he says, build yourself up. Take the responsibility to grow your own spiritual life. And let me tell you, I think that's an important step when you realize it's your job to grow, not our job to grow you. We are going to try to provide every opportunity, but it's got to be a personal decision. And then he says, keep yourself in the love of God. And then he moves on and he says, if we're really on mission with God, then he says, I want you to rescue people. And he talks about this spiritual battle as though people are being burned up. And he says, I want you to go after him like, like a fireman going into a burning blaze. It is important. I remember a, a military guy and a pastor were talking and the military guy said to the pastor, he said, well... You know, at least in your job, you don't have to send young men and women into harm's way where they might lose their life. And the pastor came back quick as a wink and said, oh no, my job, it's much more dangerous. They may lose their eternal life. And you see, sometimes we forget that, don't we? We have good relationships with our neighbors and friends and, and we never get to talking about spiritual things and we're not really on mission. We don't really see them as being lost. And God says, I want you to be on mission with me. I want you to be involved in helping draw them out of the deception, out of the lukewarmness, 
out of the lostness. And when you came in, there was a card that we put on your chair. And that card is a brand new series that we're starting next weekend. And we do we call this a guest series. It's, a, it's an outreach series about a felt need. We're going to talk about families. And everybody's family and family relationships need improvement. And so it's a good felt need. And I, and I want you to think about specifically handing an invitation card to one of two groups of people. Maybe you've got friends or relatives or work partners or people that are, go to school with you. And you can just invite them to come to church with you, sit with them, help them. Coming to church for the first time can be a scary thing for people. So that's one group. There's another group that my heart's really been burdened about. People slip away. They lose their love. They get caught up and they get off the path. And I, I sent out letters from a list that I researched this week, and there were about 80 people, families, that have drifted away over the last three to six months. And you know what? I sent them a letter, and that's one little reminder. But if you were to call them, it'd make a lot of difference. Is there somebody that used to sit by you, somebody that was in a life group with you? And if they've left, and if they're plugged into another church and they're growing, that's fine. But a lot of people just drop out. And, and after you've missed a couple of weeks, it feels awkward to come back. In fact, I would say sometimes I think it's harder to come back than it may be to come the first time. And part of rescuing people is that we need to say, who is it that's at risk? Are there people whose lives are being sucked into this spiritual battle that I need to go and help defend, that I need to go and help rescue and he gives us a very interesting phrase. He says, show mercy mixed with fear. And you see, it can be dangerous work. In 2014, there was a doctor named Kent Brantley that went to help with the Ebola crisis in Liberia. And you probably heard this story because it was on the news everywhere. In the process of helping others, he caught Ebola. And praise God, he is healed and he's just entering his doctoring service back in Texas now. But it was a risk. And he says to us, in Galatians, he says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. When you're rescuing somebody from a fire, you got to be very careful. And there's two dangers. One is that you can get sucked into the same error that they have. Maybe they've gotten their feelings hurt and they've gotten embittered and they start saying, I can't believe this person said that. Or, and you can begin to get infected with the same dis, discomfort or, or bitterness that they have. But I'll tell you a second kind. You can also have kind of a, a pride and a superiority, like I'm fine and you're a problem. And we can get caught into not seeing them as somebody for whom Christ died and we're trying to keep them from being deceived but we can come across kind of like we're superior, like we've got it together, like let me tell you how to get straightened out. And God doesn't need us to fix people, but by the power of His Spirit, He wants to use us to rescue people. People who've never come to faith, people who have once been in faith and have drifted away, and He wants us, you and me, to bring pools of shalom to the places where we are, pools of God's goodness, and help people grow and help people move. I want to ask, give you a couple of specific challenges, but before that, we're going to hand off to Green and to South Umqua. They're doing a soft launch this weekend, and we're excited. This is their first time. So congratulations, and we love you both. I want you in your own mind to think about what it means that God is a judge. And for some of you, you need to grasp the forgiveness of God. When I mention God being a judge and you wouldn't think of standing in front of Him as the righteous judge, some of you went back to places where you've sinned in the past and there's terrible stuff that you've done or said or thought, and you go back to that place and you need to look up Romans 8.1 and say, no, I have been forgiven. But we also need to say, God, I give you the right to give the accountability to my life, that I want you to remind me, I want you to challenge me, I don't want my life to go for nothing. 
Because frankly, for most of us who are in a church family, the danger is not that you're going to get sucked into a cult and run off and forget God completely. The danger is that we'll settle back to being comfortable and nice and we will allow our lives to be frittered away on nothing. And so think about God as that motivating factor that makes us want to build ourselves up and to stay in His love. Isn't that incredible? He's a judge that loves us. And what a great picture that is. And then secondly, who does He want you to rescue? And maybe as we were talking, you already thought of somebody that you want to invite or you need to call or you need to come alongside. And maybe there's somebody who's a seeker or not even really seeking. Or maybe there's somebody who has drifted and you don't know what this problem is. And sometimes people ask me, well, has so-and-so been coming to church? And I, I've come up with a better answer than I don't know. The better answer is, why don't you check on them? Because if God put them on your heart, then maybe you're the one that's supposed to call them. Maybe you're the one that's supposed to drop by. Maybe you're the one that's supposed to be there. So I want to lead in prayer, and I want you to wrestle with God being our judge. Do I need to accept the forgiveness side of that, or do I need to embrace the accountability side of that. And then maybe even as we're praying, ask God to put somebody on your heart, somebody that He's reaching out to, that He wants to use you. Father, thank You that You are the shepherd and the Savior, but You're also the judge. And thank You, God, that when we stand before You, instead of a long list of our sins, You will say, I see that You are in Christ, in My Son, that You are holy. But there will also be that process of the rewards for what we do that lasts forever. And God, we confess we get so easily distracted. We get our life filled with things that don't matter and don't last. And I pray that you would just challenge us, that we would see you in that rightful picture that you are wanting to bring peace and wholeness and shalom, and that you want to use us to do that. And then, Father, we pray that you'd put people on our hearts, people that you care about and that we care about, people that don't know you yet, people that do know you and have just kind of slipped away. And God, all of us get stuck at times, all of us get diverted from the path. And thank you for the kind of friends that would say, I'm not going to let you drift. I'm going to hold on to you. I'm going to be part of the rescue team. So God, help us to have a heart to follow you and to rescue people you love. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.